Welcome to this live Barbie Clinics Q&A. Once again, we're here with my friend and my mascot. <laughs> so, just going to let people check in. Let's get Instagram in over here. Welcome those guys in. So we're on Instagram. How are you doing, guys? We're on Zoom and we're over on Facebook. So, I'm just going to few minutes to get get themselves checked in. How are you doing Steve? So as always you can ask questions at any point. Um, you're gonna have to bear with me whilst I... Hi there everybody over on Instagram. Mark, Louis, Rob, how are you doing guys? Um, so the point to these sessions is purely since last, last year uh, lockdown, um, just to facilitate discussion, um, Q and A's. I get asked a huge amount of questions across social media, and I end up having the same questions and giving the same responses. So I thought, if we open up this live Q and A, it means that um, I can sort of talk it through with you guys, um, rather than over and over again in private messages. We can do this publicly, and maybe we'll learn a little bit from each other. So I'll just carry on. I'll just let a few more people log in. Facebook, hi Steve. How are you doing over there? Uh, welcome Karen again. Um, oh, Helen, <laughs> that's all right. No problem at all. So Zoom guys, obviously you can type questions into the chat box. Facebook, obviously I can see you over there. And Instagram, I have to loiter down here to just check in, see if there's any questions. And we're going to go for around about 40 minutes today, anywhere between 40 minutes and an hour. It just depends on how the conversation goes. Uh, you obviously follow me on one of the platforms, which is why you're here. If you don't know me, my name is Rachel Francis Thompson. I am a biomechanics coach and an Ivy Freed instructor. And I have a passion for movement and anatomy and all things um, biomechanical. So entirely up to you, Helen. Don't mind at all. It'd be nice to see you face. So this week, um, oh, and by the way, just in case you weren't aware, we've got hey, we've got all of the recordings of all of these Q and A's that we've done on every full lockdown through since last year are all over on the Biomechanics Education YouTube channel. So if you go over there and subscribe. You can trawl back through um, the previous conversations and chats uh, if they're of interest. What I need to do is go back and make sure there's subjects in there because <laughs> uh, trying to spin plates and do a lot of things at once um, has meant that um, I've just literally uploaded them, so I do need to go back and do that. So, Nikki, how you doing? Leanne, hiya. Adam, Raul, nice to have you along again. Martin, hey, Martin. Holistic PT Studio, how you doing? Dunk Cowie. I love all the code names. The code names? The code names? Sounds really like, like we're international spies or something, having a code name. Nikki from Cyprus, how you doing? Brilliant, she's made it. <laughs> so uh, we've got Nikki here from Cyprus, um, from the Pilates room. She uh, and her colleagues invited me over there um, a couple of years ago, and we had some great fun in their amazing studio. So I'd love to come back, Nikki. <laughs> when, when it's possible, I'd love to come back. Okay, so what are we talking about today? We have two questions, although the answers to them are quite short. I thought that this week there are several things that uh, may be popping up. Number one, uh, just the announcement yesterday has probably sent every one of you off into a little bit of a spin. <gasps> we actually can now start to maybe plan a little bit. So that can do one of two things. It can be, yay, like the end of the tunnel, or ah, mad panic. What am I going to do with my business? Because all of a sudden we're going back to face to face. So I want to talk a little bit about that and maybe some of the things to be mindful of getting back to face to face, both for yourself and for your clients. So we're going to do that last. I'm going to cover the, the questions first. So the wonderful Marina, uh, she's actually signed up to our Bobby Kennett's coach diploma. Uh, we haven't yet met, but we know each other very well. I know she's going to be watching this back on a recording. 
She's having a little break from the screen today. But she asked, first of all, what could be the cause of experiencing inner thigh slash groin irritation when engaging pelvic floor muscles? So sadly, with this type of question, I don't have enough information. So I would want to understand what you mean by irritation. Um, what I don't like to do is assume, but I'm going to imagine that there's a pull or a sensation or tightness or pain. All of those would be indicative of they need assessing, they need a diagnosis, they need um, somebody who has the ability to do an extensive sort of question, health questionnaire with them to understand if there's anything more sinister that we may not be trained in, for example. So if you're not clinically trained, a clinician would ask general health questions that we might find a little bit odd, but based on their training, they would know that those kind of questions, those weird questions would highlight if there's anything that we need to understand, particularly around this area. Just one simple example is quarter equina. Uh, syndrome and that is a very serious condition that can result in paralysis. So anybody who um, has those the symptoms that uh, are indicative of that condition, it's A and E, it's 999. Now I'm not saying that's what's happening here Marina, but just to highlight, some things can seem very simple, it's just a pulling, but actually uh, we need to work alongside our clinical colleagues to really rule uh, sinister things out. And the most dangerous thing for all of us, and when I say us, what I mean by what I assume my audience is, exercise professionals, strength coaches, Pilates, yoga teachers, and manual therapists, generally not clinicians. So when I talk about us, it's exercise and therapy guys. The most dangerous thing for us in our practice is not knowing what we don't know. And I, I've said this over and over in some of these Q and A's, and I think um, where we are getting to, certainly myself and my colleagues are putting together, is looking for solutions to really help us all communicate better. So myself and, hi there Robin, nice to have you in over on Instagram. Um, myself and my colleague, who, a physiotherapist and a, an osteopath, uh, have developed a project, uh, we call it Safety Net, which allows us and them to communicate all online and actually, if this client of Marina's uh, did talk about having a thigh or groin irritation when engaging pelvic floor muscles, we can put them through an online questionnaire which has these weird questions in them. And effectively, what the safety net does is it highlights if they answer yes in certain areas, we strongly recommend that they have a consultation with the clinician first. They can do that with their own clinician, GP, uh, or medical physio or we've set up an online system where they can have an online consultation to maybe rule things out and say, yes, you can work with them. This system will also allow the trained clinicians on the safety net system to write uh, back to you, the movement professional, do do this, don't do this. And that is all documented and protects everyone involved. So Marina, I know I've talked to you about that previously, but this would be one of those examples. What could be causing this irritation, this sensation around the inner groin thigh area when engaging the pelvic floor muscles, it could simply be um, an, an imbalance in strength. The problem is if we go ahead with that assumption without any testing in place or any diagnosis or ruling sinister things out, we could be putting them at risk. One of the things that's come up more recently as well is uh, through this safety net system is these questions can highlight when a client actually doesn't realize they have a medical condition. Um, and again, this is where we need to find solutions that allow us um, non-clinicians to help our clients who experience pain or live with chronic conditions to make sure that we're all in the right place. But with a, a tool that allows us to um, pass over information in a meaningful way, but appropriate to GDPR and the client's uh, data protection. So I hope that kind of makes sense and helps those listening. Uh, the second question Marina asked was, and this is from our I Move Freely workshop, which is um, online. Um, at the moment, there's an online version. Uh, we do do a face-to-face -face version, which hopefully we'll be getting back to very soon. 
Um, and she asked, what is segmental and intersegmental stabilization? So what's the difference, basically? And what do they mean? So more often you will see, and I had a little look around um, the internet uh, just to see what came up if you were going to go and do your own research into this. And predominantly it talks about segmental stabilization. What that's referring to is different regions of the core, the trunk, the spine, i.e. Uh, lumbar to thoracic, for example. So segmentally stabilizing through conscious engagement of TBA. And just to, well, this comes with a caveat, by the way, is we cannot, um, we hypothesize that we cannot simply engage a single muscle. Muscles work as a, um, as a group, as an integrated system. And so when I talk about segmental stabilization, it might be that we're focused on uh, the lower abdominal area, keeping that fixed. Maybe while we move the upper of the, um, thoracic area or vice versa, for whatever reason. So that would be a, a sort of a, a simple movement definition of segmental stabilization. If you do go and have a look on the internet, there's a lot of clinical papers that talk about it more from a clinical perspective. And I think this is one of the problems for us as um, exercise movement professionals and even sort of level three, level four therapists is within our training, we are coming across and doing research into the body. And predominantly, a lot of the papers and the research and the stats out there are based on clinical practice in terms of what we get as questions from clients or problems that we might face. So we, we need to understand how to interpret the research and the papers. Now, there's a colleague of mine who I mentioned earlier, he's an osteopath, uh, an amazing educator. Um, he has a background in personal training, strength and conditioning as well. And he's called Mike Grice. G-R-I-C-E. He runs um, both a school and a clinic uh, called Movement Therapy Clinic, is the clinic, <laughs> and Movement Therapy Education is the education. So if you want to learn from him, he's also got a Facebook group, I think it's called, um, oh no, I should have checked before I did this, Sports uh, and Scientific Review. You go and look for him and look for his pages, you'll find it. My apologies, I should have done my research for that one. Mike Bryce, Movement Therapy Education, you will find him on social media. And he comes from a clinical background, but he's able to um, help us understand, us being uh, movement professionals, non-clinicians, to understand better what clinical research could be um, meaning for us as movement professionals, because he has that background. So I would definitely go and follow Mike Rice at Movement Therapy Education. Um, and he will, if he describes something in a clinical setting, if you question him further, he will interpret that um, for you as a movement professional. He, he understands our industry. So he's a great contact and resource. He's certainly, I've worked with him 16 years uh, before he was a clinician and then subsequently since. And he's now uh, running, yes, yeah, Steve, thank you for that. He's now running some online anatomy education. I think it's about, is it about five more months, Stevie? So that you can subscribe and he's doing live tutorials. I think it's every Monday night. So if you're a bit of a nerd and a bit of a geek, uh, but do understand that some of what he speaks about is from his knowledge as a clinician. So it's about how do we interpret the information that we're gaining into something that's useful for us as a movement professional to keep us within our scope. Um, I've said a lot there and I need to come back to the original question. Segmental stabilization and then intersegmental stabilization is more vertebra to vertebra. So um, that might be where we, and again, if you research this, this is I think where my research ended up, um, is a lot of clinical information about segmental stabilization and clinical testing and understanding um, clinical issues with the spine, particularly lumbar area. Um, but in simple terms as movement professionals, understanding how deep proprioceptive stabilizers like the transverso spinalis group, you're probably familiar with multifidus, rotatoris, very deep muscles, they offer intersegmental stabilization, uh, but they do that across um, so that the, those muscles will cross lumbar through thoracic. So with the segmental stabilization, 
um, idea as well. So while we talk about this breakdown of definitions, when we layer it back in, um, it comes to this, the, the, the favorite question that I always come back to, or so what? Um, and so in a movement session class, uh, or even in a manual therapy session, um, you know, to understand the way the body works is the key component here. So to know how the small muscles close to the spine sit, lie, what they should do, what can go wrong. And then also the more superficial muscles and the different layers, if you like, the erectors, and then you've got the lats and everything else. So it's how we interpret information is a key component. I watched um, a really great uh, podcast last night, which spun off me frantically emailing um, the guy who was on it um, and it was through the STA so if you haven't heard of the STA again another great resource the Sports Therapy Association that was founded by another fantastic human being called Gary Benson if you are a manual therapist definitely go and check them out the membership has huge value for anyone putting their hands on other uh, on clients um, so the STA with Gary Benson, definitely a great resource. And um, it was Matt Phillips who was doing a podcast. They're doing a podcast at the moment. And he had invited Mike Stewart on. Now, Mike Stewart has um, a 20-year career in uh, physiotherapy and a master's in education. So I was really excited to listen to him, actually for the first time, I'm afraid to say. Uh, yeah, he was amazing, Stevie. And I've heard a lot of my colleagues, Mike in particular, raving about um, Mike Stewart, Mike Rice talking about Mike Stewart. And so um, I, you know, I'm so glad that I did uh, manage to catch that podcast. I believe it's still on the Sports Therapy Association site somewhere, I think. They put it onto YouTube as well. Uh, if you catch it, definitely go and have a look. Um, so I'm talking about this because, again, um, what I loved about um, Mike Stewart's um, and, and his uh, brand name is No Pain, as in K N O W. And I've always used Explain Pain and Laura Mosley's work uh, with, with David Butler to understand pain better. What I really loved about Mike Stewart um, is, again, just a different flavour, different personality, different character. Uh, he's in Kent. I think he's a Liverpoolian by, uh, by origin, but he doesn't have that accent anymore. But he, again, as a communicator, and I think this is where we, you, I, uh, Instagram, Zoom, Facebook, we need to listen to as many um, experts, professionals as possible. Um, and he talked about the layers of learning, which uh, as an educator myself, as a, as a qualified teacher learning status um, teacher, very passionate about education, but coming from a non-academic background, had poor schooling, um, still having imposter syndrome, which he also talked about yesterday, interestingly. Where um, I felt a real synergy and a connection with what Mike was saying is when you first learn something, everything is very black and white. So the first time you did your sports massage course or your personal trainer course, Mike Stewart said, you know, it's very black and white. You trust the teacher is either telling you the truth or not, but you don't know any different. You take it as black and white. Muscles go from here to here and do this, and that's it. And you're right, okay, great. Um, then you go away and you go to another educator who says, well, no, that's not true, actually. Hang on a minute. Uh, they, they do this as well, or it becomes an antagonist to itself. <laughs> and then he talks about the confusion layer. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you out there are in that confusion layer either, in my education company, my academy, Mike's or, or any other, that this is a normal part of the learning process. And I, I found it really refreshing and, and insightful when Mike Stewart talked about these layers of learning. And if you can hear them and appreciate them and understand where you are in that learning process, I think it can be helpful. We use the Kubler-Ross um, analogy of um, stages of emotion in the learning process, but I feel like I need to update that now to the one uh, about the, the learning in terms of the education process. Um, Mike Stewart did talk about four. I think I missed the third one, Stevie, if you can remember what that was. 
Uh, but the fourth layer that he talked about is where you settle into a level of confidence about effectively what you know and what you don't know and the ability to be honest about what you don't know, which is really, really important both um, for us as practitioners talking to our peers, but also for us to our clients. Um, and he was obviously highlighting the idea that um, educating clients on what we can and can't do, what is possible, what isn't, you know, it is a big part of what we do. And I'm sure those of you listening here will be, um, will understand what I'm talking about there. Um, just stand corrected, so uh, 9 99 a month for um, the anatomy, uh, learn anatomy online with Mike Grice at Movement Therapy Education uh, on Mondays at 10 a.m. So sorry, I got that all wrong. So at 10 or a month, uh, 10 a.m. on a Monday, hugely um, valuable. I strongly recommend it, guys. Um, and yes, it definitely was, Stevie. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. So Stevie was on that podcast last night as well. So, um, Marina, who, who asked those two questions, I'm hoping that gives you some degree of um, resolution. Uh, she, she knows me well. Uh, what I actually hope it does is creates more questions. So the idea, and again, uh, Mike Stewart was um, highlighting this as well, the idea of an educator is not to lecture, which is like why I find these slightly uncomfortable, it's to inspire further questions and further research of the learner to explore their own uh, knowledge and understanding and appreciation of the human body and he talked about even from his extensive uh, training and background the complexity of the human body and how um, uh, I think it was Stephen Hawkins he referenced wasn't it Stevie um, who, when asked why he didn't follow in his father's footsteps, who was a bodywork practitioner, he said, no, that's far too hard. It's far too complex and subjective. So um, that's really to express to all of you out there. Hi there, Danny, on Instagram. Um, that's just to sort of, I guess in some ways, allow you some kind of comfort in, uh, try not to feel that we're always trying to find answers and, and one day I'll get there because it never ends. And I think when you get to that fourth layer of learning in your career and your understanding and really appreciating that the learning process is kind of forever, uh, new research comes out, we get more experience, we do another training course, it changes. And, and he talked about as well, Mike, uh, Mike Stewart talked about it as well. Um, we shouldn't really be just sitting in one method. Um, so you get trained, for example, we teach the biomechanics coaching diploma, how to assess the body systematically, and it's the system really that's the gold dust, pelvis, spine, shoulder, knees, feet, and the, the order of the exercises. But what, we, what I hope we communicate is that we don't limit uh, that, and that's the purpose of the case study work, is for the biomechanics coach learners to explore the skills with their other training as a personal trainer, as a manual therapist, as a strength coach, and then subsequent training and develop their own system. So this is one system to add into all the other training that you could use portions of. And really we need to have the confidence as practitioners to know how to develop our own system that works for us our clients in our setting, our environment, our niche, with our demographic. Um, so I just found his words a real um, a joy to listen to. He was clearly um, coming from a passion for um, uh, education, great education, and working with clients, uh, which is again, it, it, there was a commonality, I felt a, a synergy there. And I think so, Helen, but I think rather than seeing that, and I know you're not saying this, rather than seeing, you know, that whole, the more, the more I learn, the less I know. I think the more you learn, the more you realise there is to learn, rather than the less you know. It's like half, cup's half, cup is half full rather than half empty. But I, I know that you will be um, on the same page with me with that. So that was the two questions we had, but what I'd like to do is come on to um, a, another subject, and that is coming out of lockdown, because finally, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And can I just say, yay! <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, you know, I feel like doing that little leap where you click your heels in the air. Um, but um, with that in mind, if you remember the discomfort of change when we were going into lockdown one, two, and then three, we've got to be prepared for the discomfort, and there will be some discomfort coming out of lockdown. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by that. Uh, because it's obviously a joyous thing, but we're not out of the woods yet. Boris has deliberately designed a gradual release uh, for a reason. And, you know, we, we are, um, you know, blessed that he's done that as a, as a long term thing rather than just letting us know step by step. So we can plan to some degree, which is great. Um, so, number one. Your clients will have deconditioned in some form or another. What I mean by that is, even if they're coming to your online classes, doing them face to face has, a, and I know the classes is a long way off, lot off yet, but this is just where I'm trying to think is, let's go to June or whenever it is. Is it June 21st when everything will hopefully have lifted? Let's go that far ahead. Coming out in that gradual release of lockdown, um, our clients will have deconditioned. And what I mean by that is um, doing it in your front room, um, on a carpet, or with not much space, or without somebody actually seeing you as clearly as they might in person, could mean, and, and the, the rest of the, the time they're spending outside of your online classes, maybe they're less physical. Coming out of lockdown, even if they have continued with personal training um, online or classes online, coming back to face to face is, is a different animal. And we saw that when we started doing the online instead of the face to face way back in uh, uh, early last year. So understanding how it feels different and the joints are going to be different on studio floors to carpets in the front room um, and, and also the um if you imagine the amount of movement over a week or a day or a month um, is going to potentially go from uh you know far less to far more people might get over excited about oh i'm going to book on all the classes and so and the personal training so again just being mindful that we need to kind of really come right back down to a preparation for movement program to some degree, I would suspect. Now, there might be obviously odd cases where that's not the case, um, and I'll stand corrected. But in general, most of our clients will have deconditioned. Number two, you could well have deconditioned. Now, I've got a squat rack I got for Christmas. <laughs> Yay! I've got weights, I've got a bar, I've got kettlebells, you know, I've got dumbbells, but I've definitely deconditioned because it isn't the same. You know, you know, with, with, with hubby in the studio with the dog running around. It's not the same as going to the gym and having, you know, that it, it's different. Um, plus the amount of times I've trained in a week might be less. Uh, the weight I'm lifting has gone down because it's just well, I've got I've got no goal at the minute, you know. So even your own physicality, manual therapists. If you haven't done manual therapy for a while and then you get back to manual therapy, so Brad over on Insta, uh, you know, then actually that's a very physical practice. So we will have deconditioned. So we need to consider preparing our own bodies for getting back to face to face as a manual therapist, a personal trainer, or a group X instructor. So one of the things that I've just, I'm doing this just for myself. Uh, if anybody wants to join me, you can. Absolutely no pressure whatsoever. Uh, but I just wanted to do it myself, uh, and it's my spine mobility project. And it's I'm not in any pain. I just feel like I don't move as well as I did before. I'm doing some of my uh, movement drills, and you know what? It feels a bit stiff actually. And when I actually tested myself, if you've seen any of my social media posts, I actually quite vulnerably uh, stripped off and took photos of my spine in lateral flexion, flexion extension, rotation. And you will see, I was actually like, that's not really that great. Now, so what? Because I'm not in pain, so that's fine. In my head, I'm thinking, well, I want to come out of lockdown feeling ready for getting back in the gym. 
So one of my projects, or this is my project basically, is to improve my spine mobility so that when I come back, I'm at lower risk of hurting myself. So that, that's my project. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Just got a little comment coming through. Now, I've just finished the Army Freely workshop, so I hope to help myself and my clients move more freely. Me too, Nat. Yeah, good. I'm glad you've uh, enjoyed that. And gosh, you got through that quickly. That was only just the other day. Well done. Gold star for Natalie. <laughs> um, so, okay. So what can we do additional to prepare the clients we've got for when we get back to face to face, whether it's manual therapy, personal training or group exercise? Well, we can do testing. So obviously we sell education and testing. Go buy my courses. <laughs> Of stuff online, it's my QA. I can plug all I like. So you can go over to the Public Education website, click on workshops, online CPD. There's a whole batch of them over there. The online CPDs are designed for online assessing. If you come to face to face, we'll teach you the hands on stuff. So you can do the online stuff right now. If you are really strapped for cash, which a lot of people are right now, movement assessment is really easy. Because you've got two types. You've got the evidence-based, which is the stuff we teach you, and then you've got just active daily living. So you might say to a client, well, it might be as simple as show me how you get up and down off the floor. Now, of course, there's a lot of joint actions and things going on, but as a basic fundamental test, I will film a client getting up and down off the floor, particularly if they come to me and said, can you help me? I've got a sore back and I'm struggling to get on the floor with my children to play. Because ultimately the goal isn't reducing the back pain, it's getting on the floor with the kids, right? So if I can film the problem movement, I get up and down off the floor, we can use that as a very simple benchmark. It doesn't tell us what, uh, sorry, it doesn't tell us why, they're having a problem, it just tells us what, like, okay, they, they move like this. What the evidence-based testing does is it gives us more detail as to which parts of the body are the ones that don't move so well. So evidence-based movement testing is far more um, isolated. You've got your functional movement screening over from um, gray stuff, the, the functional movement stuff, seven tests, squats, lunge, you know, overhead and things like that. That's multi-joint testing, great. And that kind of comes into your active daily living stuff. So just basically film them squatting. What they don't tell us is whether the problem is the ankle, the knee, the hip, the spine, the nerve, the muscle, the joint. And that's where the evidence-based sort of individual testing really comes into its own. So that's the stuff we can teach you online uh, with our courses. But the basics, if you've got clients online, just ask them to show you movements they find that are uncomfortable and ask their permission to film those movements. So a squat, I would film front arm, side arm, get them to talk you through it, it feels stiff here, and it gives you a little bit of, of a benchmark. So the spine mobility project, I did effectively all the movements of the spine. I did a couple on the floor and I did the rest on the chair. What the chair does is it fixes the hips and takes any cheap movement away from the hips down or as much as possible. Then I did spinal flexion, extension, side bend and rotation and I filmed each one and then did snapshot, snapshots at end range. So I've now captured my start point, my day one spine mobility project. I've splashed it all over social media so you can go and have a look. If you haven't found it, Ping me a message, I'll send you. It's all on the website, on the blog page anyway. So what are the tests telling us? My spine's a bit stiff, so what? Well, it used to move a bit better than that. Okay, so what? I'd like to move a bit better just in case. I wanna see if I can move it a little bit better. If you add pain into this, it's different. Pain is a red flag. Go and get a consultation, get cleared by a clinician. So I'm not talking about that. Let's push that over to the side. Just talk about movement quality. So that's really where our remit kicks in as movement professionals, Pilates teachers, etc. So you've got two causes in, in the basic terms. You've got extrinsic causes and intrinsic causes. Extrinsic is lifestyle. So I'm sitting at a desk 
I'm doing my Zooms, I'm writing programs, I'm designing online content, I'm sitting for long periods, so I need to change that. And then there's the intrinsic causes of my spine being stiff. And you might think, well, if your spine's stiff, do spine mobility. That's absolutely logical and totally makes sense. I agree. But there could be underlying things. So, for example, if you imagine a side bend test, what else could be limiting my ability to side bend other than the spine or the, the mobility of the spine? What other things within my body might be limiting my ability to side bend other than the spine, the joints of the spine? Anything else can you think of? I'm throwing that out there to see if anybody uh, has any ideas. Brad, Steve, you should know this. Uh, hopefully, Roz, yeah, May 17th, sounds good. Yes, Brad, you need to look after your wrists, especially with that fantastic gym you've just built. Any thoughts? Any thoughts, guys? Instagram, any thoughts? What else inside the body could limit your client's side bending, lateral flexion, other than the spine? What else? could be the limiting factor. QL, spinal erector, so basically the muscles. Yeah, great job. Thanks, Brad. Anything else in there? What else could limit? Yes, Pete, underactive, shortened muscles. Yeah, exactly the same as Brad, fantastic. Base of support, Charlie Moe says balance. Yes, could be what would affect balance. What's the, what's the mechanics? of balance being uh, degraded. Tight hip flexors, could be. Tight muscles, yeah, could be, over on Instagram. Uh, Fernanda and T. Merrill, Jim. Good misalignment, Brent says, could be. If you imagine your, the basics, keep it really simple, the three basic substructures, the bones, the muscles, What's the third one? What is the third subsystem, apart from the bones and the muscles, that could be inhibiting, inhibiting lateral flexion testing? Nerves, there you go, challenge fitness deal, well done. So, yeah, exactly, Izzy, you got it. Proprioceptors, perfect, yes, you got it, Charlie Mo. Yes, Heather, if somebody's had an amputation, that could affect their balance if they haven't got the same base of support. So if there's one leg missing, that's going to affect their balance as well. In simple terms, spine lateral flexion could be not just the spine mobility that's stiff, it could be the muscles or the nerves that are tight or inhibited as well. So in the project that I'm setting up, I want to systematically start to work through all the potential causes of my spine being stiff. So obviously my lifestyle has meant that I'm, I'm burning less meat calories, uh, I'm not moving generally as much, I'm sitting more, um, my training has kind of like, the volume of training has gone down. Um, yes, I move regularly, daily, I, I do running, yoga, strength work, so I do get a combination of all of, all of those. Uh, I haven't for the whole of lockdown, I've got to confess, but I'm back in it now. But I'm now coming out of my um, kind of lockdown mode. I'm like, right, I want to prepare my spine, my body, for when I can go to different places, go to the gym, do classes again, teach classes. I want to make sure that I'm doing that without a risk of injury. I don't have pain. Yeah, I'm a bit stiff, but I don't experience pain. That's something else, remember. So, exactly right, guys. So, the muscles, the nerves and the bones around the pelvis and the spine could be contributing to my spine stiffness. Anything else could contribute to spine stiffness apart from pelvis, spine, bones, muscles and nerves. Yes, Sharon. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get to that one. We're already on solutions over on Instagram, which is great, and on Facebook. What else could be inhibiting my spine mobility apart from pelvis, spine, bones, muscles, nerves? Yeah, yeah, that's a bit far out, Brad, but I'm with you. <laughs> what else 
could, within my body, be inhibiting my spine mobility apart from, I'm telling you the answer here, by omission, pelvis, spine, bones, muscles, nerves. What else could be inhibiting it? No pain, ignore the pain, Brad. We're just removing pain from this example for now. Yes, Nikki, uh, I would probably include fascia with the muscles and the nerves, I guess. So something else. I kind of told you when I said pelvis, spine. I told you by omission. Yes, there you go, Helen. The shoulder. So if you, you can try this if you like. If you imagine sitting for long periods, the muscles in the front of the upper body become short and tight, overactive, whatever you want to call it. The nerves in the arm start to uh, be inhibited. The scapula start to get locked around the thoracic spine. So my thoracic spine becomes more locked into flexion. So even the shoulders could be inhibiting my spine mobility. Great stuff. So you've got the ash. <laughs> Fetus, food, flatulent, flatulence and fluid. Charlie, all of them. <laughs> yes, they could all. And especially if it's all of them at the same time. <laughs> so what we're highlighting here is where we might think, okay, um, I want my client to come out of lockdown and be ready for movement. And, you know, I want to reduce the risk of them being uncomfortable. We, we need to recondition them out of the lockdown physicality, even if they've been doing classes and things which I have through the whole of lockdown, I've been exercising regularly, and yet my spine is still stiffer now than it was at the beginning of lockdown. So, to prepare the client, can we do some basic fundamental movement tests? Now, the point of the tests is just the what. It's just telling us what the start point is. It doesn't tell us why, it tells us what, all right? The why, is the bit we're not gonna know until we start to prescribe techniques to improve the what. So by identifying all of the potential whys, food, flatulence, fluid, <laughs> spine, shoulders, nerves, muscles, fascia, by identifying all of those, we can then go, right, okay, how many exercises or techniques do I know for pelvis muscles? List them. How many techniques do I know for spine muscles, as in uh, to improve movement quality? For the joints, for the pelvis, for the spine, for the shoulder. And can we systematically start to ask the client to do this technique for a couple of days, let's retest your spine mobility, let's see how they move, and then you'll see that something will make the change over time. And then the things that don't, we push those aside. The things that do, fantastic, do some more of that. But not forgetting the reason why we are like we are, apart from being locked down, obviously. Uh, if we're spending a lot of time sitting at a desk, is there a way that we can maybe have a desk environment, and you don't need a fancy uh, sit-stand desk like this, you could have uh, you could squat on the floor and put your laptop onto your chair. You could get a stability ball, you could have a footstool, you could stand up and put your computer onto a box, you know, or books and take the books out gradually throughout the day. So you're gradually altering your position rather than sustaining the same position for long periods of time. So there's so many things. So you, yes, it was Charlie, thank you. There are so many things that we can do, but if we just chuck all of them at a client, without any system of analysis, give them an exercise, reassess, then try something else, see how they change. It's very much guesswork and we don't know the techniques that are truly helping. So can we systematically test, list some exercises and using the least contraindicating first. So certainly understanding uh, low-grade muscle energy techniques. So Izzy was talking about over on uh, Facebook, that are very, very safe and simple, 20% effort, hold for 20 seconds, um, some, some low-level uh, wall glides. So I'm on my wall glides at the minute. 
and then systematically going through lumbar tilts, knee rolls, thoracic rotation, flexion, um, allowing the uh, front of the chest to release using maybe METs as well or muscle energy techniques. But documenting which ones we feel bring about um, the change or that the client likes. You know, and getting the feedback from them about when they feel the change occurred. Sorry, Dr. Gorgeous Sally. Uh, did you want me to go through anything again if you missed it there? It's because I'm on several devices, doctor. I'm so sorry. Uh, desk is my massage couch, Sharon says. Yes, so again, it is about different, um, different ways of positioning yourself while you do something that doesn't require a huge amount of movement. Um, so, uh, so Helen was going to say good, but preferred Charlie's expression. Yeah, Charlie's very down to earth, aren't you, Charlie? <gasps> okay, so where are we up to? What do we do? Oh, I said it was only going to be 40 minutes. Okay, so what's the problem? Can we test it? Can we document? Can we get a benchmark at the beginning? Can we film our clients right now online and start them on that process towards improving their movement quality and preparing their bodies to come out of lockdown with a reduced risk of injury and an improved chance of optimizing performance? I don't mean elitist, I just mean of squatting well, of being able to get the benefit of loading the muscles uh, without the risk. So those two concepts, so reducing risk of injury, optimizing performance, um, so that coming out of lockdown, we gradually, we're able to gradually condition our clients back to normality, the new normality, whatever that's going to look like. But certainly um, for a lot of people, it is going to be about moving more. And I suspect for some, quite suddenly, uh, I think once that lockdown, uh, the lockdown lifts to the point where people are going back to gyms and classes, and I know that's not the same time, but the point at which we need to really look at our class and program structure and actually pull it back a little bit and pepper in some of those I move freely techniques at the beginning of the session, or maybe even just some pure I move freely introduction sessions as people start to come back and out of lockdown. And for yourselves, guys, um, you know, check out the Biomechanics Education YouTube channel. I've uploaded some I Move Freely classes um, on there. So, Nikki, go and have a look at some of those. I think you'll like some of those. Um, I, I did one for instructors. Uh, I'll send it through to you, actually, to share with your group in Cyprus. I don't think it's on the public platform, so I'll, I'll send you a link to that in a moment, Nikki, on email, um, which is an online I Move Freely class. Brian Move Freely Instructors, so I did it for the Biomechanics Coaches, so I'll send that through for you. Um, other than that, I think, I think that's it. I, I mean, guys, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but as movement uh, body workers, exercise professionals, whatever it is you do with the body, just remember for your own physical self, as well as your clients, prepare your body. Start to think about the periodization of preparing between now and when we're allowed out. I feel, I feel like this, always I've got this image of like a herd of elephants, like lockdown lifts and it's whatever time it is and like the streets just fill up with, <laughs> fill up with people. Yay! I think, is, is hugging allowed after, is it May the 17th, I think? I was, I was having a look. Um, lifetime Fitness. We'd love to do more uh, Do I Me Freely course. It's over, Lifetime Fitness 46. It's on the, the website, bombingandisseducation.com. If you want to learn I Me Freely techniques, it's our most popular workshop. It's the one that Nikki and the guys in Cyprus did. If you go onto the website, click on the online CBDs. We have got an online version at the minute. It's only 94 quid. Use it on your own body. Share it with your clients, please. Um, if you're in the UK, then we're going to be launching the face-to-face -face schedule um, uh, in, in about the next four weeks or so, um, so that you can come along and just upgrade and get the face-to-face -face training as well to get your certificate. Um, but yeah, go and grab it online. Uh, Natalie's done it. Um, hi, Lorna. Lorna in Amsterdam. How are you doing? 
Just have a little look back, check I've missed any questions over on Instagram. Forgive me. Yeah, tendons, guys. Yeah, sorry, I missed that one. But yeah, you were right. Misalignment tight flexors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So I am going to continue with the um, with this um, until we are free, which uh, I'm not sure actually how many more we've got. Is it another couple? Three? I'm not so sure. You tell me. But I'm going to keep going while we're locked down. Uh, Brad says he would recommend I'm in for any. Thanks, Brad. Um, so I'm going to bring it to a close, guys. Thanks so much for coming. I need more questions for next week. So back here again. Again, if you want to watch the all the previous Barbie Headings Q&As, go onto the YouTube channel, Barbie Headings Education. Subscribe. It will let you know as soon as I upload anything that you can watch. Oh, you too, Helen. Uh, Nikki, amazing to have you in Cyprus. Please give my love to all the guys out there uh, in Cyprus. Tessa, you're very welcome. Uh, great stuff. Yeah, no, you're very welcome, guys. Uh, Instagram. Thanks, guys. See you all soon. Maybe see you in the classroom soon. Definitely you, Pete. <laughs> Thanks, Holistic PT Studio. We've always got the Facebook group, though. Go and join the, yeah, see you next week, Sharon. Go and join the Facebook group, Biomechanics Q&A, where we will continue with this theme. We'll do the occasional lives, uh, but certainly you can go and ask questions there at any time. Wendy, welcome, Izzy. Mwah. See you soon. Uh, take care, guys. Closing down.